Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Nicholas Spira, and today I'm going to be talking to you about artificial intelligence art, or AI art, as well as providing a few examples of how to get started using these incredibly powerful tools at your own computer or mobile device today. So what is AI art? Generally speaking, when someone refers to AI art, they are most likely talking about the machine learning tool of inputting a text prompt, such as a man holding a hamster, and receiving an image of a man holding a hamster. These machine learning methods train upon thousands of labeled images to learn what is a man and what is a hamster in order to generate an image that contains both of these features. The tools are only as good as the data used to teach them, so if you were to train a machine learning algorithm only on pictures of dogs, all it would know was how to recreate a picture of a dog. For example, these are two pictures of dogs shown here. Here there are two puppies, and this is an adult pit bull. Both of these images contain dogs, however, they're pretty different, and you would have multiple labels for each image, such as dog, gray fur, looking into camera, or two dogs, puppy, golden retriever. These labels allow it to learn these different elements of the image to recreate them later. If you have a machine learning algorithm that's been trained to pictures of dogs and you ask it for a cat, it won't know what to do. Like with people, we learn through our lives being exposed to new ideas and new words and new things. AI tends to do the same process in that it learns what a cat is by its shape, its color, its lighting, how it looks in relation to other objects in an image or more. So for example, here is a picture of a cat that is photorealistic and taken from the front on perspective. Below it is a picture of a very simplified sketch of a cat. If you show this to any adult, they would know that this is supposed to be a cat, but the differences between the two are actually pretty stark and obvious. So an AI needs to learn what a cat is by seeing thousands of images of cats from every different perspective, art style, angle, and more. Our brain learns to recognize patterns, and artificial intelligence does a similar thing by embedding these patterns into their knowledge base of what a cat is. I highly recommend watching some videos by Two Minute Papers, which will be linked in the description, and do your own research to learn about the fascinating methods behind machine learning and these other associated tools. To start, I'll give a very brief history of artificial intelligence art. In the past couple of years, huge improvements in the techniques of machine learning have enabled the public release of text-to-image tools such as DALI and DALI 2. These were some of the first simple and widely available tools that anyone could access to type in a simple text prompt and get out a variety of fantastic images that attempt to recreate the subject matter of the input text. In the few short months since then, various other projects have built upon these methods and vastly improved their techniques with better training data sets, resulting in several publicly available tools. The two most currently relevant tools as of December 2022 are Stable Diffusion and MIDI Journey. Stable Diffusion is an open source approach to these tools, allowing people to download the code themselves and run image generation on their own computers if they have powerful enough graphics cards. This open source approach also has a variety of other online tools that utilize the same methods, but you don't, don't require you to have a powerful PC. The barrier to entry to use these tools keeps dropping, but it is still a limitation to need a powerful PC of your own if you want to run it locally. MIDI Journey is a method similar to this in that they have their own servers and run their own AI on their servers, but allow you to interact with it through their Discord. It has branched from Stable Diffusion a while back, but it's long since become its own thing. It is based out of Discord, allowing users to input text prompts into a Discord server and generate upscale images as desired. The newest model, version 4, is incredibly detailed and sophisticated compared to previous models. Now that we've talked about all these different elements of artificial intelligence art and grossly oversimplified and definitely got several of the descriptive parts wrong, let's just dive right into it and use this tool, MIDI Journey, to make some really interesting artificial intelligence art. I'm going to start with a simple example where you type into the MIDI Journey bot on Discord the, for, the prompt forward slash imagine. You then type out your prompt and let's just go with a dog. A dog. I press enter. It sends it off to the server and begins to process generating up to four different images of a dog.
There, it completed making four different images of an artistic rendition of a dog. Because we only said a dog, MIDI Journey and the AI behind it has no intuition as to what we mean more broadly. So if I want to recreate an image of, say, a pit bull looking into the camera with this coloration of fur and everything else, I have to be much more specific. So this time I'm going to imagine, imagine, forward slash imagine, a pit bull dog with gray black fur and brown eyes looking into the camera with a white chest on a sunny day and and then I'll add some additional descriptive words such as photo real detailed lifelike additionally at the end I'm going to use a different version of mini journey so mini journey's current most recent update includes version 4 which is much more sophisticated than the previous versions or the default version so I type dash dash v space four at the end of my prompt to generate this next image with the highest most recent version of the program i'm going to press enter and now we'll wait for this to train and generate an image that we're looking for this version has finished iterating you can see how stark the differences are between the first one with just a dog and our specific text you can see here we have four different images of hyper-realistic, almost lifelike pit bulls that don't look too unlike our example image that I pulled from Google Photos up here. However, it's still not exactly perfect in terms of the coloration, but that's okay. That's part of this process is that the AI doesn't truly ever understand exactly what you mean. So it can only infer based on your text prompt and the images it has available to it in its training data set. So let's go with looking at these four, I think I like the bottom right one the best. Or no, actually, I think I like the top left one the best. So I'm going to do U1, which means upscale one. The numbers are one, two, three, four, from top left to bottom right. And these buttons beneath the image refer to those. So if I press upscale one, it's going to take the top left one and spend some time making it more detailed and enlarging the image for a better quality result using the same prompt as before. All right, and there you have it. Here we have a high quality, upscaled, hyper-realistic image of a pit bull from the front perspective with gray black fur, a white chest on a sunny day. So clearly it did its very best to recreate what we asked it to make, even though it's not a perfect rec recreation of the example image above that I showed of a real dog, it's pretty close. And so you can see the power of this tool and how good it is at being able to make the idea that you have in your mind. So now that we know how to use Mini Journey, we can do even more sophisticated elements in our prompting design, such as including source images. So I'm going to scroll back up to this image of a pit bull on a sunny day. I'm going to copy the link by right clicking on the image because I've already put this into Discord here in this chat. So I'm going to go down, I'm going to use the exact same process for imagine adding the prompt, but now I'm going to paste this URL to the image that I have above, as well as use the exact same prompt as before, and use this source image as a sort of initiation or example for the AI to learn from. It is using the colors, the composition, the arrangement, the features that I can detect within the image as this initialization for it to then generate an image for us. So if I put in the link to the original image and I use the exact same prompt, let's see what we get out. All right, now we're talking. So if you look at these example images that are output, they all look very similar to the initial image. Again, the artificial intelligence art has never seen this specific picture before, but even though it hasn't, it's able to infer the features, the coloration of the fur, the shape of the head, the eye color, the background color, the chest color, all of that, and built that in with our text prompt 
into its knowledge of what a pit bull is supposed to look like and generate these output images. As you can see on the bottom right, let's go with bottom right and upscale it. This is going to generate a very unique and yet very similar image to our starting point or what we were trying to recreate. All right, <clears throat> and here is the result. So in summary, we used detailed descriptive prompts as text, as well as an input image to generate this output image that closely resembles what the original animal looked like. It has similar coloration, it has brown eyes, it's a sunny day. So as you can see, you can really do a lot with this tool to make any particular image you might want to make. It's very impressive what they've managed to accomplish in a few short months. So that was an example of a, a real object, a dog, real creature with lots of training data. Let's start to get more creative and do other images that have probably a lot less training data in the data set than dogs. So here I have prepared a image of a Nordic village that I pulled off of google.com on a stock photos website. I'm going to upload it to start to my discord here. And as you can see, it's this small Nordic village on a river. There's some cliffs in the background. It looks overcast. And there's also this sort of uh, overlay of noise from the stock image elements. So what I'm going to do is imagine I'm going to copy the URL to this image I just uploaded, space. I'm going to describe it as a Nordic village on a river near cliffs on an overcast day, comma, hype. Uh, let's do photo reel, detailed, and lifelike. D dash dash V space four for the most recent version of Mini Journey. And let's see what it does with that. All right, now that that has completed, let's take a look at these results. So as you can see, each of these four images contains completely different buildings and different orientations. But once again, it's managed to incorporate a lot of these elements from the source image. Additionally, if you look closely, you can see these crossbar and lines that are there that have gibberish words in them. This really highlights how a lot of the data used in training these models was actually from stock image websites as well that has these built-in labels. The AI doesn't understand what we're really asking for. All it knows is that in all the images that it has labeled with Nordic village or small village or cliff or whatever, also op often have these lines in them. So it recognizes these lines as being a feature that should be included, and it does. It overlays them on top. This is a really interesting example of how AIs don't learn to infer what you mean. They learn what they can see and they label it and then they incorporate that into their knowledge of what these things are. So even though we don't want the stock image over details, let's upscale one of them anyway. I'll do this top right one because I like it and we'll see how that turns out. All right, upscaling is done. And so here we have these red houses, dark black houses, reflective water, cliffs, overcast sky, green grass. All of these elements are clearly present in the original picture that we gave it, as well as what you'd expect to see in a text prompt as we described it. You also see these overlaid uh, gibberish words and lines that are representative of that stock image source, as well as the image that we provided. You can see there's these lines, there's the little swirly uh, stock image qualifiers. Here you have black buildings, red buildings, mossy rocks, cliffs, overcast sky, reflective water. All these elements are, are detected and then transferred into our final output image. So you can begin to see again the power of this tool but also the limitations because it doesn't actually know what you want. It just transfers what it infers, what it thinks you, you mean by giving it this input image and this input text prompt. Now that we've completed that aspect, I'm going to do a couple more examples before I end the video and talk a little bit about the controversy surrounding these topics. So I am a dungeon master. I love playing D&D, &D, and I often use these tools to generate art that I would use in my games for characters or settings and places. 
I sometimes use a tool called Hero Forge to generate 3D models of characters that look a specific way. And what I did was I did that previously, took a screenshot and made this art, uh, if you will, this screenshot of a three-dimensional character using Hero Forge. This by itself is a great tool for being able to quickly make characters that look a certain way and use them to describe your uh, characters in your D&D game. I highly recommend Hero Forge if anyone wants to try it out. That being said, I would like to have better, more detailed, more realistic painted art of this character. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to forward slash imagine and I'm going to use this input image that I screenshot from my original character and describe it as a tan elf with purple and blue clothes and a brown mohawk. Can't, I don't know how to spell mohawk. Uh, that's good enough. I'll do V space four. And I'll also add another qualifier on there as dash dash Q space two. That means quality two, which means it'll take a little bit longer to train, but ideally the output quality image will be higher than the default. So let's go with that and uh, see what it comes up with. So now that we have done that, here is the output of these different images. Uh, you can see that all of them have a purple mohawk, which is sort of funny. It seems to have interpreted my prompt with the color purple when describing his clothes as being applied to his mohawk. You can see the top left one here tried to make the mohawk brown, but only for part of it. Uh, again, these are all limitations of the way that it interprets your text prompt and how you write it. But overall, I'm pretty happy with this result. I feel like the top right one, or maybe the bottom left one. I think the bottom left one is the best version of this character that I've made uh, from the text prompt. I'm going to upscale it as well and see what happens. All right. So now that we've completed that, we have this final output image. You can see it captured elements of the original image, like this belt on his chest, the color of his clothes, the red mark on his forehead, and the mohawk but it failed to properly interpret the color of the mohawk and a couple other things like the color of his eyes and whatnot. Overall, this is pretty cool and I'm happy with it. I can go into Photoshop and change some of these elements like the color of his eyes and his hair and tweak it a bit further, but that's the power of these tools. It can take what you give it from a rough approximation and a simple, pair, uh, simple descriptive line of text and generate something really neat like this. So the very last example I'm going to give is not just one, but two separate images combined to make a new image. So the first is a picture of art done by Band B on DeviantArt. I'll have the link in the description. It is of the character Molly Mock Tea Leaf from Critical Role. And the second one is a purple tiefling woman of unknown name by Rachel Denton on Twitter, also linked in the description. And I'm going to take both of these and try to make a new character that is purple, has horns, and looks like something in between both of these characters with some additional descriptive text of my own. So I'm going to do imagine. I'm going to add the URLs to both of these images that I've already put into Discord. And then I'm going to call it a purple tiefling woman with a black cape and a red vest holding a staff and standing on a cliff during a starry night sky. In, I'll change during to in front of A. Now let's see what it does with this. Again, I'm going to add V for quality 2 and see what the outcome is. All right, that was its attempt. Here is the outcome. You can see that didn't quite get all the features I was looking for, but I think on the bottom left, it's probably the best one. So I'm going to upscale that. You can also do variations. So you can pick one of the four and iterate to make all four of the outputs look similar to that one. I'm not going to do that here for brevity, but I will just be upscaling this one on number three. All right, and here is the final output. So as you can see, it has done okay, not exactly what I told it to do, but it did a variety of things. It 
interpreted the red vest as the red coat and ignored the black descriptive element. It did give us a tiefling, which is a person with horns. They're purple. They had red eyes, just like the input image of Molly Mock, and curly purplish hair like Molly Mock and the second image, but the horns were different from both of them. It's holding what could be interpreted as a staff, not a very good one, but it's definitely on a starry sky standing there. So overall, pretty good and not perfect, but a decent attempt. You can begin to see again what this could be used for to make new characters, new artwork, or even if it's not what you want, it's not final artwork, at the very least, this can be an incredibly powerful tool for artist inspiration and for generating variations of different poses and different background settings for art artists and uh, designers to use as a starting point for their own artistic works. So now I'm going to talk briefly about the controversy present here in these tools. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the tool is only as good as the data used to train it. And sometimes these tools are trained with data that is used by artists who otherwise might not want their art used in that way. For example, this is being used by two other artists inputs as the sort of inspiration for this output image. And while this is something that is not necessarily, it's not the same as copying, it's not the same as copy and pasting elements of their image, it's drawing inspiration from it, much like how a human artist would draw inspiration from those two previous pieces of art to make their own. This still uses this learned feature that is coming from these original images that can then be applied to make this new image. And while there is, again, I think a lot of the fear that comes from these tools and the um, distaste that artists might have for it comes from the perception that it's stealing or benefiting from their work. And it is. It wouldn't exist without their work as the inspiration for it, as the way to, to learn how to make these images. But at the same time, it's an abstraction. It's not a, it's not a true stealing of work. It's a learning from, just like humans do. So the issue is complicated. And for us to make ethical tools in the future, we need to learn how to properly get permission to use these, uh, these objects and images to be trained upon from artists and to also do it in a way that is not going to massively displace or disrupt the way that some of these artists make their livelihoods. As you can see, even though it's not perfect, this is a pretty powerful piece of art. And I made it in a few minutes with minimal effort. Uh, this would take a human artist many, many hours to draw or sketch this in a, in a real program, even though they could probably do a much better job of the composition, the hands, the overall appearance. This represents a shortcut for casual art, in art enthusiasts like myself to get close to the real thing. And that means that artists who do this sort of work for a living might be looking at a reduction in the amount of possible work that they could have as these tools become widely available. So all that in mind, think about how you use these AI art tools ethically. Think about where they get their images from and think about what you do with the art once you've made it. For personal use, this sort of thing is great, but it does seem mostly problematic to be taking these kinds of images, saying that you made it yourself as an artist and then trying to sell them on the internet since you didn't make them really, you just sort of pressed a couple buttons and got these out. It's a complicated issue. I look forward to the future of these tools as they continue to get better and I can use them for my own personal benefit. But I also want everyone to be aware that like it or not, these tools are here to stay and we need to learn to adapt and use them in the future of art while also maintaining a way of helping out existing artists to make that transition and learn how to use these tools while not displacing or devaluing their work since it is still a soulless machine churning out these images as opposed to a artist with intention behind them. I hope you learned something here today and I hope you can use this tutorial and this, this thought discussion as a basis for how you use this art in the future. I hope you have a wonderful day and have fun making art.